process of learning is that uh, research articles are like textbooks, they're really valuable pieces of information that you can gather uh, information beyond what you read in the textbook. So take a look at those articles, uh, but I would suggest you just look at it. It won't take long to read, but uh, read the abstract, uh, but also read the introduction of these articles, okay? Because it really helps provide you a good foundation behind why we're studying I certainly try to convey that, but when you read it again, it becomes more uh, solid in your mind in terms of why that's important. So, so one article, a group article, would be uh, researching and discussing uh, the two proteins involved in growth, the MRV protein and the, the FT, SZ protein, right? The Z ring. So we're going to talk about that. And the other group is going to talk about biofilms. Okay, so and we've already discussed those. And so take a look. We'll really give you information. In course, it's, it's not it's important to know, but I always uh, pull out a question or two um, from those articles, the introduction, and the, mainly the introduction. The abstract is a little bit detailed. So the introduction of those research articles, again, are, it's like a textbook. It introduces the topic, says, okay, why am I learning this? Why is it so important? Right? It's all right in there. So take a look at that. Uh, it's a really good study too. Second thing is I'll, this weekend I'll give you a preliminary study guide to get ready for the test. Okay, because I'm sure some of you guys are uh, itching to get started. And of course, you know, the summary of every lecture that I give will be the foundation, right? Because I suggest chapters that you need to look at. If you haven't done that, let's make sure that's on your plan. But then I'll give you a little bit more detail about uh, certain things to focus on. Okay. Much of it's going to be, um, what I'll probably do is start off with just terms. Okay. I've been throwing a lot of terms out there for you. And your ability to know what those are and how to use them is going to be critical. Okay. So that's, how, that's a good way to start the preliminary review. And then uh, we'll build on that on Wednesday, where I'll give you specific questions related to our topics. Okay. And so from that, hopefully you will be uh, well suited for the Friday exam, which again I'm looking for you to develop your own uh, creative way of telling me that you understand the topics that we're discussing. Okay. So that's how we'll eventually get get there. Okay, so I think it's, it's time. Well, let me just do a quick uh, review and a transition into the last two parts of this cell wall <coughs> uh, synthesis and uh, antibiotic process. So we, we, we didn't quite finish the uh, synthesis part, but, but let me just quickly review some of the structure part. So remember, we're talking about peptidoglycan. Major structure found in gram positive, but also in gram negative cells. So, what's gram, what is the peptidoglycan? It's really two components, right? It's, it consists of two sugars and some amino acids. That's a peptidoglycan. Okay. And so, uh, within that, it's important for you to know what those sugars are. So, you need to you need to know the names, not just the, the abbreviations, but the names. In acetyl glucamic acid and acetylmeramic uh, acid, right? Or in acetyl glucosamine and, and acetylmeramic acid. So the meramic acid is the one that has the, the amino acids that we call the stem peptide, right? So that's important. And, and the synthesis part, we, we talked about how the sugars are linked. There's an enzyme called the transglycosylase. It connects them through a beta 1,4 linkage, okay? And the 1, 4 represents number of carbons, right? The beta is the orientation of, above or below the, the, uh, the ring of the sugars, okay? And uh, we also talk about the end of the stem peptide, consisting of two amino acids in the L form, right? L-alanine, L-alanine, okay? So that's going to be important, okay? So those are the, the pieces that you, hopefully you're, you're grasping, you're beginning to say, okay, I, I get all of that. Just need to remember that because I'm just going to test me on that. So when we talk about synthesis, Daniel asked a good, good question here, and 
you know, like any textbook, there's always a little bit of clarity about that. I wanted to explain this a little bit more. Because I, what I'm saying was that uh, ribosomes are not part of this stem peptide synthesis process. Okay, that little paragraph suggests that transporRNAs are not part of that as well, and that's incorrect. TransferRNAs together with the ribosome is not what happens. The delivery of the amino acid still requires the transfer RNA. Okay. So that's the difference. Okay. So before we move on one more time, I had a couple people ask me this question. And because I will ask the question, what's the conservative aspect of stem peptide synthesis versus translation? Okay. In other words, what step is used in both? Transfer RNAs is used in both. What's the difference? The stem peptides do not require a ribosome, do not require message RNA, right? Whereas translation, you have to have <coughs> message RNA and you have to have a ribosome, right? So that's the difference. So make sure you, you, you know that. Uh, because it's really important when these cells grow, it actually becomes a really important decision when they make to decide whether they're going to support the formation, the synthesis of the cell wall glycan, or to make these other proteins that are really important for the cells to survive. Okay, and so having enough of those transfer RNAs is really important. It's like you know your gas tank. If you don't have enough of those, then problems can happen. Okay? So it's really interesting how that uh, that develops. Okay, so the one last piece that I want to mention about synthesis that I didn't talk about is this other enzyme called, which is which is basically the opposite of the other enzyme we've discussed so far. So these, uh, such as the penicillin binding protein, okay, which is an enzyme that causes, creates these crosslinks uh, between the stem peptides. Okay, those are bond forming. So then you have to have these other enzymes, if you think about it, when synthesis is occurring at the septation stage of cell division, you have to break some bonds as well, right? So we haven't talked about those. So what do we call those types of enzymes? We call them autolysins. Okay, and that's in your notes. So an autolysin is another set of protein enzymes that are also present that are involved in breaking these uh, sugar bonds that separate them and open it up so new ones can be inserted in, and also break the cross bridges so that they can also open up, right? Because remember the whole purpose of, of that is to build and make a new cell, okay? So now what's interesting is that in order for this to be successful is you have to have a balance between how much of the autolysins, the bond breaking enzymes, and how much of the bond forming enzymes you have, such as penicillin binding proteins in the cell. Okay, if you have too much one or the other, you're going to have too much bond forming or too much bond breaking, right? And what, what's really evident when you grow cells is that if they don't grow very well, a lot of times you can have disruption in that balance where you're breaking more bonds than you are forming. Okay? And that simply weakens the cell wall and eventually these cells don't grow. Okay, so and that becomes a really important point in terms of how we address developing new drugs that target, you know, bacteria in terms of how they grow. One of the ways you can disrupt this balance. Okay. So anyway, that's that's the last piece of synthesis, the auto license. And the balance and what they are, the bond breaking and all proteins. Um, so now let's talk about um, a process that we, we consider antimicrobial. Okay, so what do we mean by that? That's just a way in which we can prevent or kill or inhibit uh, cells, such as bacteria. Okay, and so an example of an antimicrobial would be antibiotics. Okay, and of course, the very first one that we discovered years ago in the 20s, accidentally, scientists by the name of Jennings uh, was doing this experiment. If you don't know the story, it's really interesting. He was actually doing some experiments related to uh, streptococcus and some other types of gram-positive organisms. And so he had this plate, and he basically was done with his experiment. He discarded it. Uh, and so he came back a few days later and discovered the plate was contaminated with some fungi. And what was really interesting is the fungi around this plate, which had his bacteria that he was studying, was a zone or basically an area where there's no growth. And so he, he 
sort of put things together and thought, well, maybe this fungi is maybe <coughs> something that's killing this bacteria. And so, you know, in the 20s, they it took 20 years to eventually uh, discover that this compound that this fungi produced, known as penicillin, was the acting agent that actually was involved in killing the bacteria. So that's what we're going to talk about. It's the best, it's the first discovered and best known, and it's known as penicillin. So how does penicillin operate? What's the function? Well, what we discovered is that penicillin actually serves as a substrate to, to an enzyme. So what enzyme is it a substrate to in the cell? It's an enzyme to these bond-forming enzymes that create these cross bridges. Okay, and, and, and you can see um, in your notes how, how that's essentially uh, shown. So when these cross bridges form right here, there's an enzyme that's involved in this process. Now the name penicillin binding proteins was was uh, derived based on the fact that it was it was discovered and proven that penicillin, the actual compound, binds to this enzyme, and therefore the enzyme struck substrate combination, hence the name penicillin binding proteins. Okay, and we use the abbreviation all the time out there in the literature, PBP. Okay, so that's 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 basically what they are. So as we discover new enzymes that bind to penicillin, then it's likely to be called a penicillin binding protein. And cells in different strains of the same genus, species, or different genera have different proteins that we call penicillin binding proteins. So there's a whole variety of them out there. And that's interesting because when you take penicillin as the, as the original compound, what we're, we've been able to do in chemistry is we can actually develop what we call derivatives of this. So we can actually synthesize uh, penicillin, which is what we call a beta-lactam compound. We can actually make uh, compounds that are very similar to that. What we've been able to do, and we call it a derivative, is we maintain one part of that structure of that compound, and that's known as the beta-lactam ring. Okay, so it's really important you understand what the beta-lactam ring is. So what is that? Well, this is the beta-lactam ring. Basically, it's a square, if you will, uh, looking structure in terms of its chemistry. Okay, it's highlighted up there. And so that's that was the structure of penicillin. Uh, right out of the, the fungi. Okay. And of course the derivatives are simply what we call the R group, which means this this portion here can be changed. And so you can attach this to that, this to that, and as we do that, you develop different types of names for these derivatives of penicillin. For example, you guys are probably familiar with ampicillin, right? So that's the structure of ampicillin, you simply remove this portion and attach that to there and it becomes ampicillin, right? So we we can do this, and the effect of these compounds are still quite powerful. So how does that happen? Well, as I said, it's a substrate to a penicillin binding protein. So when we say substrate, we're talking about, again, a uh, lock and key concept, right? Enzyme is here, there's a nice little pocket, substrate here, and it fits really nice. That combination happens, and it's usually a really good example of where the enzyme can bind a substrate and it can either engage in a reaction. So it's just cleaving the bond and producing a product, right? So that's that's what's happening here. The penicillin binding protein has this pocket and it's looking for a perfect substrate to fit this. And so normally what it does is it recognizes the structure of this cross breeding uh, effect. So if you take a look at this, this is the, the, the two B alanines on the stem peptide, okay? And so if you look at that structure, it has something very similar to a beta-lactam ring, okay? If you look at the structure of a penicillin derivative, such as ampicillin, you, you have this beta-lactam ring. So now the penicillin binding protein has the ability to bind to one or the other. Okay, so there's a, there's a competition that can happen when you give somebody this penicillin derivative, okay? And so what happens is when your penicillin binding protein, which is supposed to cr form cross bridges, ends up binding to the, the drug instead, the outcome is what we call a suicide outcome. So what that means is it binds 
but then it doesn't engage in the formation of a cross bridge. It just binds. And so the outcome is not what it's supposed to be. Whereas if it binds to the amino acids at the end, then it forms the cross bridge, right? And that's good. So what happens is the more ampicillin <coughs> you add, the more likely your penicillin binding proteins are going to bind to your higher concentration substrate, right? Which is your penicillin. And as a result, suicide outcomes happen, meaning no cross bridging. And if your cells don't cross bridge, they're weak cell walls and they eventually die in lice. And that's why the administration of ampicillin is so effective. That you're preventing the cross bridging because of this competition occurring between the, the ampicillin drug and the stem peptide ends, those D alanine, D alanine amino acids. Okay. So that's why those two amino acids in the L form are so really are so critical. Okay. Competition. You can use the word as well too, it's not used as much, but it's, it's a similar to what we call an analog, right? Analog simply means structure looks like something else in nature. Okay. And so when the enzymes bind to these, they they can't tell the difference. Okay. It'll bind to whatever ones happen to be present in a higher concentration. Okay. So that's that's the effect of it. So it's quite interesting in terms of how that happens. So is that clear in terms of how that happens? Remember, it's a competition, a suicide event, no cross bridging versus events that allow cross bridging due to the fact that you've got similarities in this beta lactam ring structure that's also found very similar in amino acids such as the alanine. Okay. Alright, so of course we'll see an example of how that happens and that cross bridging. So now let's talk about um, oh one note about, about this too is that now let's think about how this happens and, and when it's most effective. Okay? So two scenarios. Say you got a bacterial cell here. It's in this vile but, but non-culturable state, meaning it's not dividing, it's just alive, you're sitting there. And you got another test tube that has actively dividing cells. You now add penicillin to both of these tubes, and you're determining whether the, the cells begin to, to lyse. Which ones, which tube would, would you predict would show cell lysis? The growing one or the non-growing one? The growing one. The growing one. All right? Because remember, the effect is that as new cells form, they have to have cross bridges to be stable. Okay? Penicillin is preventing cross bridges. So these new cells that are forming are weak. And so they're going to lyse. Whereas in the other two, cells are not dividing, they're just sitting there. Okay? And so the this competition that we're describing doesn't happen. Right? Because there's no there's no cross bridging that's required, right? Because the cells aren't dividing, they're just sitting there. So they're, they're not going to lice, right? So that's essentially what will happen. So the effect of penicillin really is based upon cells having the ability to divide. And that's really what we discovered. Because remember, in nature, sometimes bacteria don't divide. They can just sit there, particularly in some biofilm-type environments. And what we theorize, and there's a lot of studies that I've shown evidence for this, is that when antibiotic resistance happens, this is one of the mechanisms that bacteria may, may engage in. They may just stop growing for that particular time in which antibiotic concentrations are high. So they're protected, right? And as soon as that antibiotic concentration uh, dissipates, then they start growing again. They just, that's, they survive, right? We call that antibiotic resistance. So it's really kind of an interesting, and there's a lot of ways they can be developed resistance, but this is certainly one way that we discovered that might be one mechanism in which they do this. Okay. But what are the more traditional ways in which this can happen? Well, um, before I talk about the second antibiotic, I want to just kind of go over the, the resistance mechanisms. So what happens is, when you think about antibiotic resistance, there's some traditional ways in which this can happen. Okay. And the one that's most directly associated with penicillin 
is, a, is the one that involves modification or <coughs> number one would be inactivation of the drug, second would be modification. Okay, so let's talk about the first one. When we say inactivation of the drug, how would how would that be associated with resistance? Well, you take a look at the the penicillin, right? It's got that beta lactam ring that's really important. So what they're saying is that if you had an enzyme that had the ability to cleave the beta lactam ring, disrupt the ring, which is the most crucial part of the drug, then you probably have inactivated the drug, hence resistance, right? And that's exactly what can happen, is that bacteria can acquire uh, a gene that encodes for an enzyme called beta lactamase, okay? And that gene, of course, can be transferred to other cells, and they become resistant too. But if they have this gene, and it produces this enzyme called beta lactamase, then that beta lactamase will then bind to your antibiotic beta lactam drug, cleave that beta lactam ring, disrupting the function of the beta lactam drug. Therefore, it no longer is effective, meaning it doesn't play as a competitor for the penicillin binding protein. Okay, and so the bacteria now grows just fine in that environment, as long as that beta-lactamase enzyme is produced, right? Now, not every bacteria has the ability to produce beta-lactamase, but the ones that do certainly are what we call antibiotic resistance, okay? And then the second one is <coughs> modification of the target, okay? So remember, the penicillin binding protein uh, binds to the two alanines, Okay, that's its target to allow cross bridging to happen. Well, what bacteria can do is they can actually change that combination and still survive. So in other words, instead of having the dialanine, dialanine, it can be dialanine L-serine. So now you've got a, a new terminal amino acid on that stem peptide, right? Remember, your penicillin binding protein needs to have the two alanines. And so what can happen is bacteria can produce another penicillin binding protein that doesn't recognize the two alanines, but does recognize the alanine serine combination. Okay, And that can be a process in which bacteria can produce those genes that may have remained silent prior to this resistance development. Right. So that's what can happen. So you've modified the stem peptide. Right, so now penicillin binding proteins prefer an alanine serine combination and not the alanine alanine combination. Okay, and that serine doesn't have the same beta lactam structure that's similar to what the penicillin binding proteins that recognize beta lactam drugs require. Okay, so that's how it gets around it, and now it forms those nice cross bridges. It doesn't matter how much penicillin happens to be there because those enzymes are not recognizing that as a substrate, right? And that's how they get around it, modification of the stem peptide. So those are the two that I do want to mention that I would like you to, to recognize as a couple of ways in which this, this can happen. Of course, this just talks about a, a lot of the others as well that we don't have time to go into in class, but certainly it's important. Um, you know, they can kick, as, as antibiotics enter, they can kick them out, right? That's what we call the drug efflux pump, okay? Or they can develop um, really interesting structures in the cell wall that make it very difficult for <coughs> compounds to get into the cell, okay? Not just the, the cell wall regions, but also internally. Because remember, a lot of antibiotics don't just target cell wall synthesis. They can target other parts of the cell as well, okay? So having said so, I also want you to be familiar with, okay, antibiotics attach cell wall synthesis. What else do they do? Well, they also do other things as well. I think I have a list of what that is for you guys. Here we go. So be familiar with other types of antimicrobials. Same thing, antibiotics, okay? Antibiotics target cell wall synthesis, okay? But what do they target as well? Well, they can target protein synthesis. Okay, so this is where it's important when you think about it, that the antibiotic has to penetrate the cell and get inside the cytoplasm, right? Because that's where protein synthesis happens inside cells, right? 
So if it can achieve that, then what happens is they'll then disrupt translation. Particularly what they do is they, they bind to ribosomes, and ribosomes is a crucial part of translation, right? So if you disrupt that, then you disrupt the ability of these cells to make proteins. Of course, that's really crucial. You disrupt protein synthesis, the cells don't get the enzymes and the other proteins they need, it's going to die, right? Quite effective. Uh, we have a lot of what we call analogs, and these are what we call sulfur drugs or analog drugs, where we can have um, certain substrates in your biochemical pathways, right? Every, every pathway has uh, different substrates that are important for enzymes to bind to produce the product. That product is now a substrate for another enzyme to produce another product, right? That's what we call a pathway. But each one of those products, if, if you develop a drug that looks similar to those, to those substrates that become products, then a competition happens. A lot of drugs we've developed are what we call metabolic analogs. So they compete, and you can disrupt the pathway of these systems, and therefore you can prevent the cell from growing. Okay, very, very uh, common way of doing that. And then the last one is uh, the nucleic acid ones. This one here is probably the most uh, disruptive to the host, because a lot of these drugs target DNA synthesis. Okay, and what we've discovered is that the enzymes involved in DNA replication, whether it's a bacterial cell or whether it's a human cell, are very similar. Okay. So DNA is DNA, right? And so if you disrupt bacterial DNA, you're likely going to disrupt your own DNA as well. And that's not good. And we call these side effects. And you know those are, are ways in which we do still use a lot of these types of drugs that target uh, nucleic acid synthesis. But again, you have to be very careful about how you use them. But again, a lot of times they're based upon the fact that these strains of bacteria may be developing resistance to a lot of these other types of uh, ways in which we treat them, so this might be an alternative. Okay. And so the, the story goes on, it gets very interesting, and I think also it's complex, just to throw out some other possibilities. If, you're, if you have knowledge about viruses, there's a set of viruses that we call a uh, phage, and, and there's specific ones that bind only bacteria, we call them bacteriophage. And that's a normal process in which bacteria can obtain DNA and then acquire resistance and develop expression, right? So when we talk about how, how they share information, uh, what, what are typical ways in which resistance can happen? So one way would be through this uh, transformation of what we call a transfection process. And then that will be over here. Okay. So this third process called transduction, that's a bacteriophage event. It's a virus. Infects specifically bacteria, injects its DNA, it acquires that, and if the DNA that's injected happens to carry resistant genes, that's one way in which that can happen. Okay? And so they they actually have ways in which this bacteriophage can be engineered in such a way that they, they're, also, they're actually very good ways of treating uh, different types of infections, particularly the ones that have developed resistance and are very difficult to treat. Okay, And so one of the last resorts of treating these, um, and not a, so much our country, but uh, the last extensive study in which this bacteriophage treatment to, pe to treat patients, which were basically had no other means of, of treatment, uh, occurred in, in Russia back in the day. So it was really interesting how they were able to save a lot of people because there wasn't enough, there wasn't, there weren't any drugs that would allow them to combat some of those resistant types of, of organisms that were in their, in their patients. So they administered this phage. Remember, it's, it attacks bacteria only and it lyses them. And so that was one of the best ways in which, you know, and sometimes that's that's a method we, we we're trying to develop today. How can we engineer phage as a treatment for killing particularly these strains that are very resistant to multiple types of drugs. Okay. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on out there, but it's a derivative of this understanding of this process called transduction. Okay. Moving up, conjugation. That's when two cells are very close to each other or sometimes come in contact. 
It could either be membrane to membrane contact or what we call extensions of these pili. And what happens is you can develop a channel between the two cells and exchange genetic information. Okay. One of the, the places in which this is commonly uh, occurring is in a biofilm. Okay. So think about it. it. Makes sense, right? Biofilm is a community of cells. They're all together, right next to each other, physically together. So when they're that close, what can happen is whenever this process called competence develops in the cell, meaning the cells open up their membranes, they become very porous, and they allow molecules to come in and out more often than if they're not competent, that this is a way in which they can actually begin to uh, take in DNA. Okay. So conjugation is, is, is quite common. And then the first one is called transformation. That's just what we call naked DNA or just DNA on the surface. Okay. If DNA comes in contact with a competent cell, it then has the ability to take that in as well. Okay. And that's that's a tool we use today all the time in the lab, in research labs today. Yeah, you can take your gene of interest, put it in an expression plasmid, which makes your expresses your gene. You take that DNA plasmid, you then transform that into a cell that then allows you to, to produce the protein that you want. We do that all the time, real common process. Okay, there's a couple ways you can do it. You can make cells competent through chemical competency, or you can use uh, electrical uh, processes, and we call this electroporation. Basically, you shock the cells for little guys, and some don't survive or die, but some survive, and when they do that, their membranes open up, boom, the plasma goes in, and now you've got DNA that you're interested in putting into the cell through this transformation process, and now you grow these, and you can actually do, do your work. Okay? And we developed this uh, in the 70s, 80s. First time we did this successfully with uh, this human medicine was the human uh, gene that encodes for insulin. We took the gene out of the human chromosome, we put it in a plasmid, we put that into E. coli, and now E. coli produced the protein called insulin for us, and that's how we were able to study it and really understand uh, the protein from the human uh, body. Okay, really cool stuff. And so E. coli is a common, what we call workhorse, the bacteria that allows us to produce and synthesize foreign genes. It will accept a lot of them, not always all of them, but a lot of them. So there's human, plant, other eukaryotes, or bacteria to bacteria. If you're interested in studying genes and the proteins that they uh, produce, you put it in, in E. coli and it will make it for you. Okay? And we use transformation to do that. So it's really, really cool stuff. So, so that's how that whole process happens and some of the resistances that develop based upon this interaction that's, that's most crucial. Okay. So let's let's review real quick, because there's certain things that, that I want you to, to understand. Number one, as far as uh, antimicrobials, understand penicillin, understand derivatives of penicillin uh, exist. You don't have to know the names of the derivatives, you know that derivatives can exist and that the mechanism behind penicillin is a competition between the beta-lactam ring in the penicillin and the beta-lactam ring-like structure in the D-alanine, D-alanine portion of the stem peptide. <coughs> so what's it competing for? It's competing for the penicillin binding protein, right? And so if it happens to pick the penicillin and not the uh, stem peptide, then suicide happens, right? So make sure you understand that process. Okay. Secondly, when the resistance happens, explain to me how that can happen. Well, there's two possibilities, right? You can have the bacteria producing an enzyme that feeds the beta-lactam ring. We call this the beta-lactamase. And of course, the importance there is that if the bacteria doesn't have the gene for that, then it's not going to have that capability, right? But if it does, then there you go. So the question would be, how, is there a way in which bacteria that do not have this gene, can bacteria acquire this? And the answer is yes. So now you need to tell me, how does that happen? Right there, right? That's how bacteria acquire DNA. Through transformation, a conjugation, or a transduction mechanism. 
Okay. And if that happens, that might be a way which they can produce this beta lactamase if they don't have it. Okay. And the second one would be the ability of bacteria to produce another penicillin binding protein that now has the ability to bind to a different stem peptide terminal end. Instead of dialamine dialamine, it's dialamine serine. Okay, and the serine doesn't have the beta lactam ring similarity. So those penicillin binding proteins could care less about the beta lactam ring because the serine doesn't look like that. And so if you administer beta lactams, those penicillin binding proteins are not phased at all. They'll just continue to bind to the serine, make the cross bridges, and go on growing without any effect upon that administration. Okay? And so if you're ever wondering about how does that happen, okay, what you're saying is that this in penicillin binding protein that, that now binds to this new serine, where was that in the first place, right? Well, there's a process called, and I already introduced it to you when we were talking about biofilms, it's called differential gene expression, right? What that means is that the cell at one stage have genes that are what we call turned off. Okay, they're not expressing and producing the proteins. But then under a new condition, then those genes can now turn on and we call it induction. And the fact that you have an off gene and an on gene, you look at those two cells, they're, they're phenotype. This, what, what, that's how we describe cells, they're phenotype. Their ability to not only physically look <coughs> different, but their physiology is different as well. Okay? And so now what, you're, what can happen is the fact that and, and antibiotic treatment can play a role in this. So if you're administering penicillin and you're trying to think about how does this switch from penicillin that, that can now bind to a serine happen, well, what can happen is that certain levels of antibiotics can trigger this differential gene expression. Okay, One example, and that's why it's so important that people emphasize this, is that when you administer an antibiotic, it's really important that you give enough of it and you keep it in high enough concentration to kill the bacteria. Okay, If you administer low doses or if you're exposed to low doses, see that all the time in the in the media right hand soaps have really have concentrations of antibiotics but they're so low that they're not really effective and what's happening we believe is that that low dose is triggering this cell through a signal that's saying okay we now can survive this low concentration but we should also switch and so when it's time to actually give you a high dose of that you now have a, a lot of resistant bacteria in your system because you've constantly used or have been exposed to low doses of antibiotic. Another scenario would be your doctor tells you to take it for 10 days and you only take it for three because you're feeling better, right? Again, that's a low dose exposure. What happens is it triggers differential gene expression. Those cells now produce possibly a new type of penicillin binding protein. So when you get sick again and they hit you and you then take that, it's no longer effective because it's not recognized that it developed a resistance. So there's some really interesting sort of events, if you think this through, that begin to fit some of the basic fundamental things that we're teaching today, right? So that's, that's the kind of concept that I want you to think about. And that's going to be a really good answer if you can develop that within your answer and give it back to you, okay? Which goes beyond just saying, okay, boom, there's the definition, this is how it happens, period, right? So think about it and really put some thought into it. And you know, if you can do that, you'll never forget it. I guarantee you. Um, if you can get there. Okay? If you just memorize it, you'll forget it in two weeks. Okay? But if you put some thought into it and say, okay, hmm, really interesting. You know how this happens. Synthesis is important. We discovered a really interesting way in which this can be affected. And we also uh, I've thought about how this occurs and how it can be resistance can develop and different ways in which this can happen based on your normal life, right? So we all engage in using soaps. We all engage in going to the doctor when we get sick. Okay, so think about that because you know a lot of the questions I develop are going to be like that. Okay, you're sick. You go to the doctor. He gives you medicine. 
you don't get better, think about what's going on, right? Hmm. Or let's say you're exposed to some antibiotics through soap washing for months and months. And then you went to the doctor and they found out you had this resistant bug. If you were just to guess what might have happened, you can go through that process and say, okay, well, this is what I think based on what I've learned in class. That's a good answer, right? So there you go. It shows me a lot about learning the concept beyond just saying, okay, tell me what it is. I need to know. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, that doesn't get you too far. Okay. All right. So that's, that's about it. So uh, any questions? Well, in here, there's no questions. Have a happy Friday. And uh, check your email. I'll be sending you some info to it this weekend.